In this generation, Audi does not have simple engines. Even the naturally aspirated V6 is actually very complex structurally, with a problematic timing belt and direct injection, and even with a Lucil. There is no chance of getting a foolproof engine. There are durable engines among both diesel and gasoline engines, but they all require a high level of maintenance and careful operation. And all Q5S after restyling have a bag of silica gel in the expansion tank, which lasts 10 years and then ruptures and clogs the entire cooling system with debris. This is especially critical for late diesel engines. Petrol 2.0 TSI engines are found under the hood of 75% of all Q5S in Russia. Unfortunately, the EA888 series, to which they belong, is not the cheapest, simplest, and most resourceful. Before restyling, they installed the EA888 Gen 2 generation, which became famous for oil burns and problems with the timing belt, especially with balancer shafts. After restyling, the Q5 received an updated EA888 Gen 3 family, which radically solved the situation with the balancer shafts and thus greatly improved the operation of the timing belt, improved crankcase ventilation, but the engines did not become ideally reliable. So that you understand the seriousness of the situation, with an average mileage of up to 200,000, there are virtually no Gen 2 generation engines that have not undergone major repairs and have no oil leaks. If the unit has not been rebuilt, replacing the piston group and seriously updating a bunch of small elements, then it will eat oil. And it's good if the timing belt has already been replaced, otherwise it's a time bomb. Hey buddy, looking for a used car? You should pay attention to the site Carmi.pro. Carmi.pro is huge catalog of cars, engines, gearboxes, and the best part is, you can find out about breakdowns of any part of any car. Absolutely free. Go on Carmi.pro and be aware of all possible malfunctions. Carmi.pro The situation is better with Gen 3 engines. In any case, their appetite for oil begins at high mileage or after overheating. Well, or after a not very successful tuning. The timing belt has a much more stable resource, and after 80,000 you no longer need to listen to whether the chains are noisy and wonder what condition the balancer bearings are in. But a decrease in operating oil pressure and the widespread use of low viscosity oils greatly increases the chances of scuffing the front camshaft support and camshaft beds in the cylinder head. Even though it's only a four-cylinder engine, its mechanical sophistication rivals that of other V8S from the recent past. After all, there are phase regulators, cylinder deactivation systems, direct injection, the pump is driven by a separate belt from the camshaft, there is a vacuum pump and an adjustable oil pump. In general, the design is extremely technologically advanced, complex, and expensive to maintain. And taking into account the unpleasant flaws in it, the motor will have to be serviced often. However, the Gen 3 is the most practical gasoline engine for the Q5 simply because the others are even worse. A description of all the ailments of the EA837 generation V6 engines is also available in the A6, C7 review already mentioned above. Diesel engines on the Q5 are considered very reliable, especially compared to gasoline engines. And the biggest advantage of the Q5 is precisely that it was powered not only by the strong V6 3.0 EA896 Gen 1 and Gen 2, but also by the inline four-cylinder engines 2.0 EA189 and EA288, which are distinguished by both good service life and successful design. The EA189 series is the most common. On the Q5, they are available in options from 143 to 190 horsepower. Early engines almost certainly had piezo injectors. They are less reliable than electromagnetic ones, but this is not as dangerous as in the case of using such injectors on gasoline engines. All units have balancer shafts, and therefore it is necessary to monitor the condition of the hexagon of the oil pump drive. It is better to change it every time the timing belt is replaced. Engines have a lot of minor shortcomings and peculiarities. You need to monitor the tightness of the intake, fight leaks, and keep the turbines in sight. Versions with particulate filters may cause increased back pressure and errors in it, but overall these engines are simple and reliable. 
Fuel equipment is well diagnosed and free of obvious shortcomings, both of a purely resource nature and of a repair nature. The EA288 engines are noticeably more complex in terms of cylinder head casting. They have a more complex switchable pump with a cap and a thermostat, but in terms of mechanics, they do not have any serious differences. True, you need to monitor the quality of antifreeze more carefully. The advantages are fast warming up and smooth operation of the engine. Diesel 3.0 engines only look pointlessly complicated and not the most successful compared to four-cylinder ones in general. These are excellent engines, less problematic than any of the gasoline ones. True, the price of major repairs may surprise you. The service life of a timing chain is one and a half times longer than that of a belt on diesel engines, but replacement is an order of magnitude more expensive. If with a belt you have a chance to meet 15,000 rubles, then changing the chain for 150,000 to 3.0 will not be easy. Here the fuel system is a little more complicated, and also the dampers of prior styling engines, a throttle, and a very dirty intake manifold are included. In general, for a detailed picture, see the material on the second generation VW Touareg. The brakes on this generation are excellent. The base already has front discs with a diameter of 320 millimeters and a thickness of 30 millimeters. This is sufficient for all variants. For the most powerful versions, as many as 345 millimeters discs are offered, so few people complain about efficiency. But traditionally, many owners try for some reason to install larger discs, not realizing that this will not reduce the braking distance. The effect is often the opposite. Without replacing the vacuum booster and master cylinder, not every driver will be able to brake confidently. The rear axle has smaller discs, 300 millimeters, and the parking brake is implemented via a screw mechanism on a caliper with an electric drive. The gear motors here are individual, which somewhat facilitates the work of the caliper. In any case, rear boot leaks are rare. Cracks in the gear motor housing are an inevitable evil, but so far the prices for non-original parts are quite reasonable. The ABS unit is quite reliable if you don't overtly update the firmware, but the sensors are capricious, only the original ones work well, and the magnetic rings in the front hubs sometimes fall apart, which entails their replacement. Hey buddy, looking for a used car? You should pay attention to the site Carmi.pro. Carmi.pro is huge catalog of cars, engines, gearboxes, and the best part is you can find out about breakdowns of any part of any car absolutely free. Go on Carmi.pro and be aware of all possible malfunctions. Carmi.pro the suspension is the same as on the A4B8 and the control arms are not interchangeable with older Audis. The main headache is not the service life of the aluminum levers. They have remained quite reliable, although the service life of the top two has dropped somewhat. They are usually replaced at mileage well below 200,000. The main thing here is the old problem, souring of the coupling bolt securing these two levers in the steering knuckle. The fist is aluminum, and experiments with burners and drilling are contraindicated for it. The lower arms are extremely reliable, but installing a trio valve silent block can easily lead to cracks, so services often require replacing the lever, although you can get by with replacing only the silent block. Hubs often fail due to a damaged bearing, but failures due to a broken magnetic ring for the ABS sensor also occur, as mentioned above. In principle, with 19-20-inch wheels in the basic configuration, you shouldn't expect a long service life from this unit and the suspension as a whole. In the rear suspension, almost all wear elements are replaceable, but not cheap. The lifespan of most is well over 200,000, and after the first hundred you can get by with minor repairs. With the replacement of the most loaded external lower elastic elements and the heavily loaded upper link arm, the steering here is with a regular rack in the subframe, which is even a little unusual for Audi, before that the rack was located on the body, with a high location. Before restyling, cars were equipped with power steering, after which a design with an electric booster was used on the rack itself. In both cases, problems arise due to a violation of the seal of the anthers, it is too humid and hot in the subframe. At first the plastic seals don't hold up, then water gets inside. 
In wrecks with power steering, shaft corrosion can be overcome quite easily when overhauled. In most cases, polishing is sufficient. But depressurization of the rack with Euro is much more expensive. In addition, the wiring seal at the rack is also leaking in general. These are the same troubles as the co-platform A4B8, but they happen a little less often due to the higher seating position of the car and better service. There are almost no serious problems with the mechanical part of the transmission. The service life of the CV joint, if you keep an eye on the boots, exceeds 250,000. The drive shaft also lasts a long time. If the engines are more powerful than 300 horsepower and the owner loves quattro starts, then the hassle increases. Here, troubles with the rear gearbox and propeller shaft are quite real. Even the SQ5 safety margin is not very large. There are almost no cars with manual transmissions in Russia, and the main complaints are the knocking of the dual-mass flywheel and a stiff clutch pedal. The rest of the design is reliable. There are a lot of different gearboxes for the Q5. The rarest is the 6-speed ZF6 HP 190B6 on cars with naturally aspirated 3.2. Before restyling, most engines were equipped with a 7-speed DL501 robot, also known as 0B5, and after restyling, gasoline cars and diesel engines with V6 received an 8-speed ZF0BL gearbox. Be careful, many sellers incorrectly indicate the type of transmission in their advertisements, since cars with DSG are extremely unpopular. They just write automatic with Tiptronic and hope that you will get confused in the designations. However, the DL501 is not so bad, but to this day it remains quite demanding and expensive to operate. Largely because it has a very capricious wet clutch, for which they use the lubrication scheme, like the starter package of Audi CVTs, with an ejection pump. Poor oil filtration quality leads to hydraulic problems. It is necessary to change the oil often and update the solenoids at the slightest call. And many owners change the oil more than once every 30,000, which would eliminate all problematic issues, but only when the gearbox has already started to twitch and needs to be repaired. Want the hard details? They are in the article about A6, C7. Rare for the Q5, the 6-speed gearbox is a typical 6HP from the ZF Gear Factory. An overview of the main design problems can be found in the article about the Jaguar XF. Well, we also wrote about the ZF 8HP more than once. These boxes have a torque reserve like the DL501, but they work more delicately, are much more complex, and do not tolerate harsh driving conditions. But during normal operation they are pleased with the resource and what is especially important is that the price for used ones from the usa is cheap they are brought to us through the emirates from 30,000 rubles but qualified repairs of such an automatic transmission are exactly an order of magnitude more expensive the all-wheel drive does not have any potentially fragile elements the main thing is to periodically change the oil in all gearboxes, not forgetting either the torsen or the front differential. In powerful versions, sometimes the rear gearbox and cart end don't last long, but for most cars this is not relevant even with mileages over 300,000. Everything is fine and does not require intervention. Unfortunately, the Audi Q5 and the 8R body needs to be inspected very carefully, not only to identify traces of past accidents, but also to simply monitor the condition of the body. Yes, the Q5 is simply resting. Mostly the paint peels off at chipped areas, usually on the arches, but you can also find blisters, especially on the visible part of the sills, the rear edges of the arches, and under the door handles. The paint is weak, the layer is thin, prone to chipping and peeling after minor damage. You will have to inspect the entire car, taking the time to check the front edge of the roof, the inner edges of the rear doors, the corners of the wings at the sills, and especially the inner edge of the front fender. Inspect the front fender on the driver's side from below carefully. The bottom is covered with plastic, but you can see corrosion of the fasteners. It is curious that the front fenders are now available in plastic, naturally, non-original. The owners are so fed up with the problem of the rusting edge. The plastic, as usual, is crooked and doesn't fit well into place, but red spots don't appear in the corners of the headlights every three years. 
lift the seals, there's often a lot of interesting stuff underneath. Especially carefully inspect the place where the rear arch meets the rear door even in externally fresh specimens there is rust in the corner. Unfortunately, even with modest mileage of up to hundreds of thousands, corrosion easily creeps out on Moscow and St. Petersburg cars, and if the car has passed 200,000, then there is practically no chance that the paintwork will be original and in excellent condition. In the southern regions, the situation is very different, but in Siberia, it is not much better. Such cars are rarely stored in a covered parking lot. They are bought for active use and are often not greatly regretted. Of course, they don't do anti-corrosive either. They just repaint it as problem spots appear. Or they paint it entirely. Unlike the A4 on the same platform, the Q5 stubbornly kept its price and therefore was not very cheap, which means that there are few neglected copies. Corrosion problems greatly complicate accident-free inspections. Abundant rust is found in the lower part of the openings, so they are repainted, creating for some the impression that the cars have been in serious accidents with damage to the power structure of the body. At first glance, everything is not so bad underneath, only peeling paint and surface corrosion on the jacks catches your eye. The bottom itself and the sills are covered very tightly with plastic, rust is not visible at first glance. Even if you remove the plastic, it's not so bad, the rust is mostly superficial. There is more corrosion above the rear subframe and gas tank, and it is often loose. But again, only in the worst examples does it really pose a problem, affecting the sealant at the welds and deeply damaging the metal. The real problem is in the wheel arches, especially the rear ones. The edge of the rear arch is generally a complete headache, it rusts both outside and inside. And if you remove the lockers, then sometimes you can find through holes after clearing away the corrosion stains. Inside the arch there are many red spots of corrosion, traditionally at the outer edge and in the front part around the plugs, at the bottom of the arch near the spar, at the seams at the top, at the shock absorber support. Let's say thank you to felt lockers, they are very plump in this generation, absorb moisture well, and the maximum compressed dimensions of the arch do not leave room for ventilation of the metal surface. Everything is complicated by the fact that the body material is relatively thin, even on the bottom and sills. The thresholds themselves are wide and multi-layered, and their depressurization from the side of the arches can be fatal. If moisture and dirt get inside the hidden cavity, the corrosion process cannot be stopped. So, through corrosion in one of the arches is guaranteed to lead to serious problems already at the threshold, which, to eliminate, will require disassembling the body halfway with the inevitable cutting of solid side panels. Rusting brackets and studs are already a classic. Yes, and subframes with rust are not surprising now. On new cars, they stubbornly do not paint them, and the metal is made thinner and thinner. In general, all body equipment is still holding up well. Even the headlights do not burn out much, however, they often fog up. This is just some kind of misfortune for cars on the MLB platform, the A4B8 has the same problems. The real reason for this trouble is the load from the bumper on the headlight housing, it simply cannot withstand it, just like the glass. The bumpers are heavy, the roads are uneven, the snow drifts are high, and eventually the headlight cracks. Leaking of the headlight on top leads to the fact that after prolonged rains and washes, water accumulates inside, the inside of the glass fogs up, and the risk of DRL failure increases greatly. The headlights are filled with silicone on all sides and covered with film, but this does not help. To repair the headlight, you need to disassemble it, replace the glass with cracks along the edge, and repair the housing. In the event of a breakdown, many companies are now ready to restore the functionality of the optics, but the prices for such work are steep. But the price of new optics is even higher. Adaptive headlights cost more than 200,000 rubles apiece, so repairs are justified. The rear optics are much more sealed. True, dynamic turn signals are often integrated into restyling LED headlights by cutting the body, but usually this does not cause serious problems. Locks and windows work reliably. Sometimes the mirror drives fail if the folding function is actively used. But door handles with keyless entry are consumables in this generation. The water inside kills the filling. 
Well, the corrosion of the aluminum mirror bracket leaves marks on the door. Hey buddy, looking for a used car? You should pay attention to the site Carmi.pro. Carmi.pro is huge catalog of cars, engines, gearboxes, and the best part is, you can find out about breakdowns of any part of any car absolutely free. Go on Carmi.pro and be aware of all possible malfunctions. Carmi.pro The electric rear door drives are strong but the bolts securing the electric motors to the roof unscrew themselves and get lost somewhere in the trim. Well, the lock limit sensors are a little capricious, which is why the closer function often stops working. There are very few cars without an electric door drive, so this applies to almost all copies. A standard problem with the gas tank flap lock can be solved by replacing the drive. You can install one that is twice as cheap as a car on the MQB platform, except that it will not have an unlocking cable. The tank neck is disposable. Any removal of the drive will damage it. The Q5's interior is good, but noticeably more old-fashioned. Owners try not to use the word outdated than its other platform mates. This is where the influence of the first-generation Audi Q7 comes into play. Sometimes there are complaints about the size of the driver's seat, it really is a very tight and high seating position, which not everyone will like. There are no special complaints about the quality of the materials. They only mention the soft touch on some buttons that is peeling off after 200,000 mileage and the too soft glass of the dashboard, which actively collects dust and is easily scratched when wiped. On cars before restyling, the backlight of the multimedia system screen sometimes fails, but the lamps are easy to change. The seats hold up well up to mileage of more than 300,000, even with minimal care, but the steering wheel and gearshift lever are usually very greasy, lose their texture, and begin to shine. There are no complaints about the air conditioning, except that the lifespan of the fan could have been longer already by the first 100,000 mileage it began to howl. The air conditioning system also works without any complaints, but the service life of the compressor in our conditions is approximately 350,000. Take this factor into account. The air conditioner radiator is also very delicate, so you should monitor the pressure in the system. The machine is very stable electrically. Most of the breakdowns are failures of mechatronic components and various sensors due to service life and depressurization as well as breakdown of flexible parts of wiring and door corrugations or wiring and engine compartment sensors on gasoline engines due to frequent service intervention. There are practically no electronic glitches here, and the self-diagnosis system is close to perfection. But there are a lot of different electronic units. You still have to do something or change it several times a year. So it's better to have your own diagnostic tools to quickly monitor the condition. 